Ian needs blood. My voice was a rasp because my throat just closed off. Buckets of it. And restraints. What happened? Bones asked in an icy tone. I don't have time to explain. Damn it, did I hear sirens? How long could I hold off the police? Just hurry. With a new stop to get blood, we'll arrive within two hours, he said crisply. And if you're responsible for what's happened to Ian, you will regret it. Good enough, I replied, and hung up. Chapter 46 An hour and a half later, dawn splashed the darkness with its first bright rays, highlighting the helicopter that had just landed. Bones jumped out, dragging several lengths of thick chains behind him. His brows barely rose at the destruction in the former theme park and the police had mesmerized into holding the perimeter, but he gave the skeletons scattered everywhere a longer look. They stink of sulfur, were his first words. How many of them were demons? All of them, I said, still struggling with the draped form beneath me. I'd frozen time around Ian for an hour, but had run out of strength to hold the spell these past thirty minutes. All? Bones repeated in disbelief. Then how? He stopped speaking when I drew back the tarp. Ian's face was a thing of nightmares, if you didn't have my unending gratitude that he was still alive. Bones stared at him. Bloody. Fucking. Hell. Less shock, more chains, I said wearily. Don't let how Ian looks fool you. He's incredibly strong. And after everything that had happened, I was running on fumes. What happened? Thankfully, Bones's question came with action. He sprang forward, slinging chains around Ian while avoiding the jaws that snapped at him. Once Bones had Ian encased from neck to feet, he picked him up as if he weighed nothing and carried him toward the helicopter. Silver! I called out. You can come out now. The Samarjal flew out of the fun house, one wing still bloody from Ian's fangs snagging it when I'd snatched Silver away from him. He landed right in my arms. Understandably, the events of the past night had left him very shaken. I didn't know your dog had wings, a delighted voice called out. Then I saw a flash of drab brown hair as Cat jumped out of the helicopter. Where did, oh, shit, who's that? Ian, Bones replied shortly. Open the cooler, kitten. We'll need everything in it. I climbed in after Bones, relieved to see vast quantities of bagged blood when Cat opened the cooler in the back. I set Silver safely out of Ian's reach and grabbed a bag, putting it to Ian's mouth. He tore into it so ferociously, half of it landed on us. Wait, Bones said. I'll hold him. His power snapped out, invisible and potent. Ian's head froze and I emptied the next bag into his mouth without any splatters. What happened? Cat asked, her head swinging back and forth between Ian, Silver, and the bodies outside the helicopter. Demon attack. Now that we were finally safe, all my weariness hit me, leaving me unable to speak in complete sentences. Need some bone for weapons, 
but rest have to go. Here. Cat handed me a blood bag, then shoved it back in my face when I pushed it away. You look terrible, Veritas. Don't worry. We've got plenty for Ian. You can take this one. I took it because I didn't have the strength to argue. Drinking it made me feel slightly less like I'd pass out. The bones, I mumbled again. I'll take care of them, Cat said, jumping out after giving Silver a quick pat on the head. Bones kept feeding Ian blood bags. Muscle and sinews started slowly re-knitting themselves in the glimpses I caught, though Bones' body blocked most of Ian from my view. How long until he can think normally again? I asked. Bones cast a glance at me. Is this his first time regenerating? Or has he been hiding this ability from us for a while? First time, I replied, leaving it at that. Half a day, at least, Bone stated. I closed my eyes. Good. That'll give me enough time. To do what? I didn't bother opening my eyes. Said Ian up the way he last remembers. It wouldn't be in Poland, but I could keep the rest of my promise. I'll tell you what to say so you can fill in his memory gaps. What memory gaps? And what about the ashes Ian is so keen that we collect? I ignored the sharpness in Bones' tone. Don't worry about the ashes. All you need to worry about is repeating what I'm about to tell you. Why don't you tell Ian yourself? Instantly. I closed my eyes, a reflex against the truth. He won't remember me. What? Short version is he pissed off the wrong demon and lost his memory of the past few weeks. Now I opened my eyes so he could see how serious I was. The demon got away and he'll be coming for me, so it's safer for Ian not to remember any of it. Bones's dark gaze bored into mine. You don't intend to even tell him you're his wife? No, I don't. It flung out of me with all the pain I was fighting not to feel. Then I sighed. All of you were right. Ian didn't suddenly fall in love. Circumstances forced us to fake being married. The rumor spread and we used it to our advantage. Don't worry, I'll make sure everyone knows it wasn't real. I'd have to convince Sung Wan and the enforcers to recant their witness of the ceremony but I'd face tougher obstacles. Sun Guan might even be happy to help eradicate my marriage. Who is the demon that did all this? Dagon. I hated saying his name, but Bone should know it so he'd know who to watch out for. My father made it impossible for Dagon to go near Ian without paralyzing pain but none of you get that safeguard, so watch your backs. Good news is, Dagon's very weak now. Bad news is, he'll heal. Bones's brows went up. Your father? Who is he? Damn it. I was so exhausted, I'd let that slip. No one you need to worry about. Got the cops sweeping up the demon bones. Cat announced, coming back in the helicopter. We'll pick them up after we get in and you set up. 
Then we'll haul them to a crematorium and incinerate them. Can't take them now, because we don't have room in the chopper, but we should have it all done by noon. Good, I said, closing my eyes again. Thank you. In the meantime, take E into a whorehouse capable of throwing a carnival-themed orgy. Don't worry, I'm buying. What? Cat gasped while Bones said, why, in a steely tone. I made a blood vow. Now, I didn't open my eyes because I was afraid they'd see the tears welling in them. Besides, I added with a flash of despairing humor, if Ian does have any memories of the events before these past few weeks, that's where he'll expect to be. What about you? Bones's tone was softer. Almost pitying. What will you do now? Don't worry, I said with a short laugh. Silver came over, putting his head beneath my arm as if to remind me that I wasn't alone. I petted him as I said in all truthfulness, I have plenty of things to keep me occupied. Epilogue Ian Someone needed to stop the bloody hammering or he'd murder whoever was doing it. Ian opened one eye, startled to discover the terrible din came from inside his head. He ran his hand along it, feeling for wounds. Then both eyes opened when he felt nothing except the smoothness of his scalp beneath his hair. That wasn't right. He'd been injured, hadn't he? Finally awake, a familiar voice said. Ian turned, seeing Crispin lounging in a chair not far from him. Crispin's hair was a dreadful shade of dirty blonde and he stank as if he'd been swimming in demon sweat. He was clothed, though, while Ian was naked as the day he'd been born. Then giggles drew Ian's attention to the rest of the room. Women naked except for leonine body paint frolicked on the other side of the large area. Men wearing gazelle markings walked past them avoiding the fire hoops that were in their path and was that a car full of clowns? Where are we? And what are you doing here? Ian demanded. Cat will kill you if she catches you at a bordello. I'm not the one indulging, Crispin replied, eyeing him with an intensity that belied his languid tone. I'm babysitting you after your hangover. Head hurt? Like the very devil, Ian moaned, then found himself snapping. The fire rings are there for a reason. Or do none of you have a proper work ethic at the next group of painted whores who walked past them? Crispin's brows rose. Hardly their main performance objective, is it? No, it wasn't. Why did he care if they jumped through the fire rings? And why did he feel the urge to praise the clowns for showing markedly more enthusiasm for their roles. Don't bother, Ian called out when the full lionesses and gazelles started to line up before the fire hoops. When they took that as an invitation to turn their attentions to him, Ian brushed their hands away. Start without me. Go, play amongst yourselves. Something wrong? Crispin asked, still in that mild tone. Yes. Not only did his head ache as if Lucifer's hammer itself was pounding away at it, he had the near uncontrollable urge to check the back of it for wounds. And why was he utterly uninterested in the erotic spectacle going on in front of him? Not only did he have no desire to join, he could barely be bothered to watch. 
How did I get here? He asked Crispin. A dark brow arched. You don't remember? He remembered, blimey, not much. Had he been upset about something and decided to numb the pain with shagging? That sounded right, but being here somehow felt wrong. What did I tell you about playing amongst yourselves? He snapped when a faux gazelle and lion crawled forward and began stroking his legs. Off you go, there's a good lass and lad. They walked away, pouting. Ian turned to Crispin. Are you certain I wanted to be here? In truth, I couldn't be less interested and look at him. He shook his cock at Crispin for emphasis. Limp as a dead snake, he is. Crispin pointedly kept his gaze on Ian's face. I can hardly offer my assistance. Eh, never fancied you that way. Good thing, too, since we turned out to be cousins. In all seriousness, though, Crispin, why am I here? Why do you stink like demon? And why does my head feel as though it's been split open recently? Something filled Crispin's gaze. Ian's sense of unease grew. His friend was about to lie to him. Even if he couldn't see it in Crispin's gaze, he felt it all the way to his bones. I smell like this because we fought the very brassed off owner of the red dragon source you stole, Crispin said. Your recent drinking rampage wasn't enough, so you stole your own source, drank it until you decided lying about being married was the height of hilarity, then called me when the source's demon owner came after you. We killed him, you set the source free, and decided to celebrate at this whorehouse. I stayed only to make sure you didn't do anything else supremely stupid. Crispin was lying. Ian Shorty grew with every merciless hammering in his head. So why did parts of that story feel familiar? This isn't right, Ian said aloud. You're lying, and I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be. Where? At once, that intentness was back in Crispin's gaze. Where are you supposed to be? You tell me, Ian snapped. And where is? He stopped. That sense of wrongness roared to the forefront, growing until Ian got up and began to pace. Something more was going on than Crispin's lies. He found his hands running over the back of his head again. His hair was white for some reason, but that didn't concern him as much as searching for wounds that still weren't there. Why was he so certain they should be? Why did it feel so wrong that he was here with Crispin instead of somewhere else? With someone else? I was about to say a name, Ian said slowly, but now I have no idea which one. Why was I about to say a name I suddenly can't remember? What the hell is going on? Crispin rose, his gaze flicking to the whores Ian had already forgotten about. Leave, Crispin told them. All of you. Deja vu had Ian whipping around to stare at the horse filing out of the room. This had happened before, but not with Crispin. Someone else. Who? Who? A woman's voice whispered across his mind, her tone more amused than mocking. Are you getting them out of the way because you're intending to fight me? Where is she? Ian found himself demanding. He didn't remember moving, but suddenly, 
His hands were on Crispin's shoulders, and he was shaking him as if he could rattle the truth out of him. Crispin's eyes went wide as he stared back at where Ian had been moments before. You teleported. It took a few moments for Crispin's stunned statement to penetrate. Then Ian scoffed, more lies, mate? That is no lie. Crispin shoved Ian back, then gave him a look of growing expectancy. See if you can do it again. Where do you think you should be right now? Shower, he found himself saying. I don't need to tell you what you smell like. The words had barely formed in his mind when Ian was staring at old blue tiles and grout that had seen far better days. He burst out of the bathroom into the adjoining bedroom, shouting Crispin, when a feminine squeal stopped him. Who are you? How did you get here? The petite brunette on the bed demanded. She wasn't alone, and her companion gave him a very annoyed look. Get out, he snapped. I paid for an hour. Ian ignored them as he left the bedroom. Crispin, he shouted again when he reached the hallway. A whoosh of power, then Crispin flew up the stairs. Ian had started down the hallway toward him when it suddenly dissolved into the blackest of rivers. A thin boat sailed over it, its single occupant appearing out of mists made of darkness. Crispin's shout of Angel of Death should have worried Ian. So should the cloaked skeleton turning its bony face toward him while raising its scythe. Instead, Ian found himself saying, Don't fret. What you're seeing isn't what he really looks like. On this side of the veil, you see what you fear. How did he know that? Were those his words? Or were they someone else's? The figure's mouth stretched in a terrifying version of a smile. Then that skull dissolved into dark bronze skin, a handsome visage, hair the color of a cotton candy mistake, and eyes that flashed with bright, silvery beams. You do remember, the thing said. I told her you would not, to ease her pain in case you cared nothing for her, but when emotions run deep, they can never be fully erased. Horror Someone had been stolen from him. I don't remember much. Fear crept over Ian, but not fear of dying. He was afraid this creature would leave without telling him what he needed to know. But I want to. Tell me what I lost. I cannot restore all that was removed. Even the little I can restore could break your mind, the creature said bluntly. Ian. Crispin had recovered from his shock enough to start edging toward him. Don't. It's too dangerous. His urgency skyrocketed. He needed the memories that had been taken from him. Risks didn't matter. Crispin's objections didn't matter. He'd knock his mate through the wall if he tried to stop him again. Give them back to me, he told the creature. The thing put his hand on Ian's head. Images blasted through his mind, fragmented and without context. A tiny blonde law guardian fighting him before changing into a statuesque woman with the same platinum, gold, and blue hair as that creature, flashes of a waterfall, then a castle, why was he fighting to save a flying dog? And what was this? By my blood, you are my wife. Feelings ripped through the next set of images. 
her body entwined with his, mine, her blood on his lips, mine, so many demons, protect her, blood and salt strafing the air, must save her, silver eyes staring in his pleadingly, I can't just let you die, then two knives ramming into his skull, one he'd never seen, the other he'd shoved through himself. Had he, had he died? That Stygian river suddenly rose up and swallowed him. He screamed, but nothing came out. Then he tried to run, to move, to do something. He couldn't. He had no body. The darkness had devoured him whole, but he wasn't alone in it. Something else was here. What was it? It came nearer, no. 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 He came back to reality on his knees, blood pouring from his eyes, mouth, nose, and ears. After a panicked moment, he realized the other world was gone. So was the creature who'd stuffed these memory shards back into his head. Crispin was beside him, while a few prostitutes and a disgruntled client clustered at the other end of the hallway. Ian, Crispin was saying, Speak to me, mate. Ian wiped the blood off, endlessly relieved that he still had a body that could bleed. Then he paused, sniffing his hand. A quick lick revealed what he'd suspected. His blood now tasted like a milder form of red dragon. Why? One person had the answers. He didn't know much, but he knew that. If the little vixen thought she could run away without telling him the rest of what he'd lost, she didn't know who she was dealing with. Ian got up. Your trousers, he told the annoyed customer, lighting his gaze up with green. Give them to me. The man took off his trousers and handed them over. Ian put them on. They didn't fit but it hardly mattered. He went down the stairs, ignoring Crispin's fluttering behind him, and took a coat off one of the hooks by the door. Crispin finally grabbed him hard enough to spin him around. Where do you think you're going? Where am I going? He repeated, then laughed. His memory was in pieces, his abilities might now include teleporting, his blood was wrong, and he was about to run headlong into a demon war, if he guessed rightly about the parts he could remember. But for some reason, he felt better than he ever had. In fact, if this feeling was a drug, he was never going to get clean. Yes, where are you going? Crispin urged. Ian laughed. To get my wife. 